Oh, hi. I'm the heretic. Hey, nice to be working with you again on something which isn't just ass-raping. We're not ass-raping anyone. N not today, anyways. Not today. On to more important topics. We've touched on the issue of the petrodollar before, but we need to explain once and for all what's going on and what we can do about it. For those who don't know, petrodollar refers to how oil is valued in U.S. dollars internationally. In 1973, President Richard Nixon devised a deal with Saudi Arabia where the U.S. would supply them militarily and they would value their oil in U.S. dollars. The whole of OPEC would soon follow by 1975. Because dollars were most sustainable in the U.S., OPEC would be incentivized to spend and invest that money in the U.S. This system is known as petrodollar recycling. Now, oil is used by every country on Earth in some way, so the fact that almost all oil transactions use the dollar gives the currency quite a lot of demand internationally, and therefore, value. After all, buyers need to keep a stock of dollars to be able to participate in the oil market, artificially stimulating demand even further. Ever since the Nixon administration dissolved the gold standard in 1971, the world oil market has propped up the value of the dollar, because without it, the dollar is worthless. So at this point, I don't believe that the Federal Reserve System needs to be explained because we've explained how central banking works in great detail in the last video. But for those of you who didn't see the last video, all central banking bases its model off of a system known as fractional reserve banking, which is a system in which banks accept deposits and create loans or investments which are intended to be paid back with interest. The problem is, is that the U.S. government doesn't produce anything and receives all of its funding from appropriated resources created by the private sector, whom are using the reserve notes the Federal Reserve Commissions from the Treasury Department on behalf of other banks when they ask the Federal Reserve for loans. So the Treasury Department is paying the Federal Reserve with taxes. Which makes the U.S. dollar effectively meaningless, as it's not backed by anything, and the Treasury Department can just print as many dollars as they like. So there's no supply curve, which means that the dollar in and of itself doesn't have any scarcity, and the marginal utility is not significant enough to be a currency, which means that it doesn't have any demand. And many people who understand the nature of fiat currency falsely believe that the U.S. dollar is just valuable simply because people agree as a collective that it is. However, this is an economic fallacy and is just groupthink. If things obtained value simply because people agree that they were valuable, market crashes would never occur, since all that would be required for a market not to crash, and all the assets investors put into backing the stock market not to be completely flushed down the drain, would be for them to simply not want the market to crash. I mean, could you imagine a market crash if currency actually worked that way? I picture a bunch of investors getting together, sitting down and saying, well, you know what? I enjoy being wealthy and having a prosperous economy, but I kind of always wanted my assets to melt away before my eyes and to fall into financial ruin, so that's what I'm going to do now. Goodbye, wealth and prosperity. Also, I'm pretty sure that I've never been involved in one of these secret meetings that every person in the entire world would have to be involved in in order for everyone to agree that the U.S. dollar has value. So no, that's not what gives the U.S. dollar value. What gives the U.S. dollar value is artificially stimulating its demand by establishing a monopoly on the medium of exchange used in the petro market. In other words, quite literally having military force imposed onto other countries, forcing their governments and their private entities to trade in U.S. dollars. In other words, the continued value of the U.S. dollar is a government program. The fun thing about the petrodollar is that there's an unlimited demand for oil, giving the Federal Reserve a justification for an endless supply of dollars, which translates into money printing. No other country in the world can do this, and if you tried it yourself, you'd go to jail for counterfeit. If you did what the government is currently doing to keep the U.S. dollar's value off the ground, counterfeit would be the most lenient charge on your rap sheet. 
And I'm sure everyone has noticed just how, shall we say, intrigued by oil the United States government happens to be. Oh, nice. Yes, yeah, I've been doing good too, man. I just got some, uh, you know, some new oil rigs over Don't here. Don't fucking say that. Did I hear oil? Oil. Uh, did I say something about oil? No, I didn't say anything about oil. No. Uh, no oil, nope. Nah, you stanky ass big toe, I heard oil! No, 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 no. That shit is mine! How they're always starting military conflicts in countries which have a large abundance of oil reserves or gas pipelines or how many times the CIA has overthrown heads of state coincidentally soon after they either launch a gold-backed currency on the petro market or announce that they're no longer going to be using US dollars to trade in their oil reserves. Well, this is why. On November 1st, 2000, Iraq announced it would no longer trade oil in dollars, switching to the euro. Fast forward a few years, where multiple NATO intelligence sources determined that the Iraqi government possessed weapons of mass destruction, creating a pretense for a decade-plus long war that would see thousands of Americans killed, millions of Iraqis dead, and the environmental devastation of the region through the scattering of depleted uranium. The only real WMD was the devastation Iraq, a major oil exporter, could have done to the US dollar had they not wasted $4 billion of stolen money. Wait, wait, did I say $4 billion? I meant $4 trillion. If the intent of the war was to help Iraqis, then sanctioning Iraq from 1991 to 2003, which resulted in the deaths of 500,000 Iraqi children dead, makes no sense. Then we have Libya, the leader of which, Muammar Gaddafi, pushed to have a single pan-African currency backed by gold as early as 2009. Once knowledge of a secret cache of precious metals were identified that would allow Gaddafi to prop up the proposed currency, the US and NATO allies worked to overthrow him, conducting airstrikes and arming rebel groups, including Al-Qaeda affiliates. That's not a wild and random conspiracy theory, either. This comes from then-Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's own leaked emails. Despite the pretense of human rights abuses by the Libyan leader, the US and NATO didn't seem to care when Gaddafi himself was brutally murdered and Libya was plunged into chaos to the point where they literally have open-air slave markets. How's that for human rights abuses? Yeah, the U.S. doesn't care. Their interest is in protecting the petrodollar. And now we have the most recent target of U.S. aggression, Syria. Now, despite the fact that Syria has been fighting Islamic terror cells in the region for the better part of the last decade and has helped quite significantly in pushing them back, now all of a sudden Bashar al-Assad decided randomly out of nowhere to launch a chemical attack against the city of Douma, which was completely unprovoked. Assad had no motivation to do so. In fact, he had a direct deterrent against it, which was the entire world who was currently fighting with Syria turning on. Syria. And the evidence for Assad's involvement was so limited that even the mainstream normie media has dropped the narrative and now says the attack was only allegedly perpetrated by the Syrian government. Which is still dishonest because since the attack, multiple independent forensic investigations have come forward with the conclusion that it is absolutely impossible for the Syrian government to have been the culprit. Now the only people left accusing Assad are the US government politicians and the White Helmets, which are an admitted quote-unquote propaganda construct operated by both MI5 and the CIA, as admitted to by the British government. CIA? MI5? Aren't these the same people who had proof that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons? So why would the US government false flag Syria? Well, it's simple. 
The gas pipeline, which distributes the largest supply of oil in the world, runs through three countries, starting in Iran, going through Iraq, and being harvested in Syria. Douma, the city which the chemical attack occurred in, is less than a 10-minute drive away from the gas pipeline located in Damascus, and is currently controlled and operated by the Syrian government with the aid of the Russian government, which, by the way, the Russian government has been openly trying to perpetuate the petroyan since 2014 a gold-backed currency launched by China, which China is attempting to use to enter the oil market, which would cause serious damage to the U.S. dollar. And unlike Iraq and Libya, the U.S. can't just send the CIA to take out their president and replace him with someone who will abide by the OPEC agreements, because China is one of the most influential governments in the world, has Russia and most other influential governments in the world firmly on their side as military allies. Unlike Iraq, Libya, and to a lesser extent Syria, Russia and China are nuclear powers with standing militaries that can fight back, taking, making the standard modus operandi of challenges to the petrodollar's hegemony being demolished by the force of the United States military wildly impractical. So what's a military-industrial complex to do? Propaganda. Getting the mainstream media to adopt a new narrative should be easy for a government that has control over a broadcast company's license and ownership of their airwaves. The narrative is that Russia hacked the 2016 presidential election so that Donald Trump would win. That Russia has a sophisticated network of trolls and bots specifically to spread misinformation. The threat that Russia poses to our democracy is huge. A phobia is defined as an irrational fear of something. Anyone with an IQ above room temperature in Celsius can reasonably assume that the mainstream media and the priesthood of statism's obsession with Russia is simply Russia-phobia. That's what I thought at first, too. But look at what's going on. Russia is a direct and persistent threat to the petrodollar. 13% of the world's crude oil comes from Russia, making them a major exporter. Now what makes things interesting is that China launched their gold-backed petro currency, the Petro Yuan. Being a major oil importer, Russia is currently China's biggest oil supplier, exchanging millions of barrels of oil in national currencies. As the tattered remnants of the perceived value of the dollar is based on and relies on the international exchange in oil being conducted on said dollar to artificially prop up its demand, large economies like Russia and China exchanging outside the dollar is a serious threat, as once the value of the dollar is exposed for the worthless paper that it is, the whole house of cards of the fractional reserve central banking system will collapse into the dustbin of history. And China is the number one importer of oil in the entire world, which is precisely why the U.S. is taking such a different approach with them, entirely in contrast with how they're attacking Russia. Both of the narratives are specifically designed to popularize two different approaches to foreign policy. The government wants people to see Russia as a threat to national security so that they can justify military action against them, and Syria, while they want the population to see China as a threat to the economy so that they can justify trade protectionism against them, which as you can see is what Trump has been doing for these last few months just conveniently following the launch of the petro yen. So no, I respectfully disagree that the mainstream media's Russia alarmism is a phobia. They are, in fact, acting perfectly rationally to a real and persistent threat to their power. Power that, I may add, they acquired unjustly and illegitimately. The Russia narrative is entirely about preserving the petrodollar. I mean, come on, if they really cared about democracy, then Trump derangement syndrome wouldn't exist. Now you might have noticed that the Petro Yuan was launched in early 2018. So how could Russia and China have been a threat to the petrodollar at mid-2016 when Russia hysteria began? Well, plans for Russia and China to trade in their national currencies can be found as early as November 2014, with Vladimir Putin explicitly stating, The initial deals for ruble and yuan are taking place. I want to note that we are ready to expand these opportunities in our energy resources trade. Energy resources means oil. So yes, 
Russia hysteria is and always has been about preserving the petrodollar. All right. So even if, for some reason, you still believe that there is an economic benefit to central banking, we've identified how the existence of central banking fiat drives the state to do terrible things in order to preserve the artificially inflated value of the currency they've created. So it's definitely a problem, but surely all we need to do in order to circumvent the problems created by central banking is just to abolish it, right? Well, yes and no. We do indeed need to get rid of the central bank, but it's not that simple, because many people who examine central banking don't see the economic side of it, and assume that it's just a construct of banking elites trying to establish political influence within governments. People aren't wrong when they point this out, but what they never seem to think about is what would happen if the state abolished the Federal Reserve. Well, the state is fundamentally incapable of launching a currency which has value determined by supply and demand, because in order for that to happen, the state would need to be able to be a producer. A demand-based currency needs utility, and the state can't produce anything. It could only coerce producers into giving it their resources, which the state can either then redistribute or use to develop nationalized programs and monopolize an industry, which means that any commodity the state creates is independent of the laws of supply and demand, so that's completely off the table. The best the state could ever do is create a currency like the petro yen, where its value is backed by an asset that's traded as a preferred medium of exchange on the market, gold being the most common example. The problem with this is that fiat has an unlimited supply cap, and inevitably you will get a higher amount of reserve notes in circulation than the actual value of the government's asset reserves, which will result in hyperinflation. So while banking elites have a powerful incentive which motivates them to establish central banks, the thing which everyone forgets is that in order for central banks to be established, the politicians have to go along with allowing them to be implemented into law by their monopoly on arbitration, and governments require central banking out of economic necessity. As long as you have a government, you cannot escape the inevitable conclusion that you will have a central bank, and if you have a central bank, you must manipulate the demand for the currency in order for it to be viable on the market, which the only way a government can do that is the same way that they can manipulate any market, coercion. So unfortunately, central banking is merely another way in which the state is compelled to perpetuate itself and expand its own influence over society. Here's how all this works. The U.S. buys tangible goods and services from other countries for worthless paper. The U.S. economy and the stranglehold of power the priesthood of statism and its banking allies have is propped up by the government program called the Artificial Demand for U.S. Dollars. When that demand is threatened, the elite is willing to sacrifice millions of lives and entire nations to the tender mercies of slave traders. All the evidence you need for the fragility of the system is the U.S. government's own actions. That which mathematically cannot last forever won't. Once the dollar's value plummets, and it will plummet because of its own unlimited supply cap, countries will be disincentivized from trading oil in dollars, further devaluing the petrodollar into an unsustainable death spiral. More importantly, because the dollar lacks value, it will lack the funding for the only other thing keeping the dollar valuable the full force and violence of the United States military. Naturally, when such a collapse happens, this will reverberate back home with runaway hyperinflation, wiping out people's savings and the value of the money in their wallets. The only way out of this is an economic reset, which, let's be completely honest here, it's gonna suck. Bad. Goods and services will become more expensive and their price will fluctuate violently, we might see a collapse of civil order for the short term as well. Fortunately, there are things you can do right now to not only prepare for the reset, but prosper. In the short term, precious metals will skyrocket in value, keeping a stock of gold and silver coins or even those tiny one gram bars will ensure you have purchasing power in the event of total economic collapse. Ever since Nixon took the U.S. out of the gold standard, the value of dollars has become completely independent from precious metals, meaning that once the dollar collapses, the value of these metals will skyrocket. 
so I would definitely recommend purchasing precious metals if you don't already have them. In the long term, people will still have assets, real estate, factories, businesses, and other facilities. Because the dollar is worthless, people will have to revalue their assets in a currency that can retain its value. I am, of course, referring to cryptocurrency. Indeed, both Filthy and myself have explained this in great detail in the past as to how counter-economics is the most viable means of achieving political change, and the links will be located in the description to those videos. But what's clear is that fiat currencies are not sustainable, and their mere existence proposes a multitude of ethical quandaries. Trading in non-fiat currencies would be of economic benefit to anyone looking to preserve their assets and to profit off of currency mathematically designed to increase in value over time. Because the thing is, relatively speaking, the US dollar is not in good shape right now. Not only do you have all of these challenges being posed with many countries trying to move away from the US dollar and new, more valuable currencies being created specifically to fulfill that demand, and on top of this there's another bubble in the housing market right now due to the Federal Reserve once again manipulating interest rates by creating a bunch of loans which can't possibly be paid back. So with this looming market crash, and the multiple different threats to the U.S. dollar that already exist, the U.S. dollar might not survive this one. So, to preserve their assets, many investors and people with saving accounts in general will buy cryptocurrency. Since cryptocurrency both has value independent of the U.S. dollar and increases in value as its demand increases, it doesn't even need to be a majority of investors. Only a few thousand people would need to put their assets in crypto in order to see a significant jump in value due to the demand increasing, which would incentivize pretty much everybody else to put their assets in cryptocurrency, which would in turn lead to an active market being established since everyone would now have their assets in cryptocurrency, which means that the value wouldn't drop again. Cryptocurrency also has another feature which, in the kind of recession the US is about to go in, would make it invaluable compared to gold. Cryptocurrency cannot be tracked by the government, so the government would be incapable of seizing your assets if, God forbid, they tried to pull another new deal on us and steal all of our assets, which we are using to survive like FDR did when he had the Treasury Department seize 70% of all gold in circulation through civil asset forfeiture. If you want to survive the collapse of the US dollar, this means buying physical gold and cryptocurrency. This also means buying non-perishable food such as canned or freeze-dried goods and bottled water, though I would recommend putting it in metal containers as plastic can contaminate water. Also, and this will be by far the most important thing to ensure your survival, stay away from the cities. Once a dollar collapses, the government will be unable to pay welfare recipients who congregate in the slums of inner cities. They will riot, and they will be violent. For this reason, it might also be a good idea to buy a gun, or if you can't buy a gun, get a 3D printed gun. Make no mistake, the dollar can't not collapse. I couldn't possibly tell you when, but the time to prepare is yesterday. Do your own research, and do what you can so that the worst that can possibly happen is what you prepared for. Questions, comments, critique? Thanks to Esso for helping me out with this video. Link to his channel in the description. I've also included the links to some websites you can buy crypto and gold from. So what do you think? How soon until the currency collapses? Support me through Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.